Welcome to the documentation track for the Jenkins Contributor Summit. We're being recorded. All right, so topics that, that we discussed earlier today, the She Code Africa project ideas. Um, I think it's good to give you a brief summary there. Contributor onboarding was a key topic in discussing how do we help more people contribute to the Jenkins documentation? What are the barriers that are getting in their way and how do we remove those barriers? Uh, Google Season of Docs was a topic that was discussed earlier. Google Summer of Code, particularly there's a documentation related project in the Google of Summer of Code project ideas. Then Wiki Migration, and then the really fun one, and this is the one I think we spent much of the time on and the interest was uh, adding site search to the docs. And there is where we're, we rely on Gavin to talk to us and share what he's observed, et cetera, et cetera. Last topic was documentation inventory and a rework proposal based on that inventory. Are there other topics you would like to be sure that are on the agenda for today? I solemnly promise we will end at two hours. Even if we haven't touched all the topics, we may end before that. No, I don't have any additions. I was at the last one, so I'm good. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Okay, so fast summary of, of SheCode Africa. SheCode Africa is an organization that where Zinab Abubakar is a member. Uh, it's, I, as far as I can tell, much of, much, it's focused on recruiting women in Western Africa uh, and in Africa in general to develop technology skills and be involved in coding projects. And what they're going to do is in April of this year, they will run a one month session with uh, individuals that they will pay to contribute to open source projects. And what they're going to do is they're seeking sponsors to support this project that they're doing as a group. And they're seeking project ideas and mentors the thing that the Jenkins project is being sought to do is to provide project ideas and mentors. So I thought that's a good fit for us. They're looking not just for documentation projects, but also for coding projects. Uh, they're will, willing to do marketing projects even. So they've all sorts of ways to get women in Africa involved in technology. Ideas that we had suggested, this one came up last week, thanks to Meg was, with Jenkins 2.277.1, we are making significant changes to the UI layout. Uh, what we previously done with HTML tables is now using divs. And by using div elements, the pages fit much better on narrow screens and they look better, but our screenshots in the docs are wrong, beginning with 2.77.1. So one project for them might be update our screenshots Another common complaint is, hey, the, the Denk Jenkins pipeline arguments in the plugin help and in the syntax usually have no documentation, no description whatsoever. And pipeline authors find that really difficult. So if they've got some programming skills, they might be able to write documentation for pipeline arguments. Um, those were the two ideas. Other ideas are welcome. Do you have questions? Do you have concerns? I was trying to look up uh, time zones for Africa, and it looks like it's GMT plus two. Right. So I don't know how much overlap West Coast people will have with that to help out. Exactly. And that's, that's a valid point. And that's one of the things that um, people on the west coast of Africa may not be, we may not be able to have time to mentor. It depends on schedules. I think Meg, for instance, actually might be able to mentor during the start of their working day because she has a tendency towards starting very late and staying up very late. And me, I, I actually start very early. And so for me, the end of their day is a workable time for me. Don't but, lie, Mark, you don't sleep. I know you. <laughs> so, so, so oh, no, there, it was fun. A few years ago, we had something that required Mark being up and presenting at like two in the morning. And it was dead man walking. 
<laughs> it, it was fun to see. It was a whole different mark. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. So, yep. Uh, so, so I think I think it's a it is a valid point, Gavin, that you make that actual mentoring by people on the West Coast for people who are in in even in Western Africa may be infeasible. People in Eastern Africa are probably completely infeasible, right? They're likely offset GMT minus you know GMT uh, minus two or more you know Somalia or those parts of of Africa may be completely unreachable for us time wise yeah what about our European friends uh, and that's that's one of the ways to recruit and certainly East Coast US and Europe are are good places to be looking for additional for looking for mentors to support project ideas not not in any way saying we shouldn't get involved but just we should know ahead of time where this is like this is we got to make sure we have contributors in the right time zones that can help mentor if going into it not so we don't get surprised after we sign up and nobody can talk to them correct right that would be completely unfair to them and and we we don't want to be that kind of unfair absolutely also what about australia yes that's another that's another viable one we don't have we don't have nearly as many contributors in the Asia and Australia part of the world in in that hemisphere. So so that's and it, it, knowing ahead of time it helps to seek them out. So you know if we know I don't know what the dates for she code oh it's April so it might be a good time now to start reaching out you know via your LinkedIn contacts via Twitter via whatever. And say, hey, anyone in you know this part of the world that wants to help out with, so you that maybe they don't necessarily have to be like experienced Jenkins doc writers, but at least there's some overlap with some people who have, you know, knowledge and people and can share and stuff. Right. Yeah. So so that and you you described it precisely. We need to start the recruiting now, and and need to uh, collect project ideas now. Uh, both absolutely okay that that took a little longer than i had expected but your inputs are great thank you very much good insights or mark oh. do we have the master to controller and uh Ooh. whitelist blacklist stuff that's, that's a good one up. right right terminology cleanup would be a great candidate very good yes so um, let's see, master to controller, slave to agent, uh, whitelist to, uh, to, to a sentence, to a phrase, <laughs> blacklist to a phrase, and yes, in the worst case, we have a word for it if we don't have, get a phrase usually. Good, very good suggestion, thank you. All right, so any other suggestions for project ideas? I had offered my favorite, helping me convert unit tests from JUnit 3 to JUnit 4. That is a question. Um, are the Shikota Africa people, um, I know you mentioned with one that they have more programming background than writing background. Um, so, do we just the whole thing do we have all the test suites we need i mean there's there's a lot of test suites we could be implementing for style and this sort of stuff i don't even know if we run a spell check against things right so and test I, automation I, part would be of it good. is like we've got all this grunt work we want done but also we want to give them something that's interesting and matches their interests mm -hmm. yeah good good suggestion I'll, I'll say flat out we never have enough testing ever yeah, yeah, Gavin. Gavin has a good point. The the correct answer to the question "Should I write a test?" is always yes. Right. There's there is so like, another answer to that question. The answer is yes. The question is how many and how long should you spend? We talked about it at the governance meeting. Like even the Jenkins IO, IO site, it, there was a talks about having a link checker hooked up to it, right? Which just went through each link to make sure the links were still valid, and that never got implemented. So like. Oh. The answer is always yes. There's always more tools and things that can be hooked up. 
Right, exactly. Right. And, uh, and automate, so, well, go ahead, Meg. Yeah, so do we have a list of tests that we would like to have? And then there's another one of just going through the docs and finding problems and then coming up with test suites that would automatically detect those. There's sort of two different. Yeah, and I, I don't think we do though. Uh, my my experience, okay, I think this one right here, get client plugin test transformation from JUnit 3 to JUnit 4 is very clearly specified and a pretty straightforward activity. And yet it's been open and available as a, as a newbie friendly task for 18 months or more with, ex, with progress from two or three or four different people and still lots of work yet to do. So that's that's just one, what I would call tiny example. And there is no no creative effort there, that's more of a transformative effort. So the creative effort part, um, write new tests, et cetera, is, is wide open. Good, okay. So, so you so, reminded me, okay. not necessarily about this topic, but we should be adding synonyms for like master and slave to Agolia as well. Yes, yes, that's a good point. This one, termini terminology, terminology aliasing, terminology synonyms go really well in that search engine, right? Because yeah. we don't want someone who looks for the word master to be, or for the word controller to not get a good answer, even if, yep. even if many of the plugins don't yet use the word. Yep. Okay. Oh, Okay, Mark, when you are talking about tests, write tests, it's the tests inside the each plugin or it's automation tests for the documentation? I, uh, I, I really don't understand the difference. So there, well, and there, there are many, many different levels of tests in yeah. Jenkins, a project with this much history. So there are plugin unit tests. For there, each plugin. For each plugin, right. Oh, okay. There are plugin compatibility tests that check interactions between plugins. There is the acceptance test harness that uses uh, Selenium and uh, goes all the way from the website, all the way Selenium and a web browser. Yeah, I just asked because that because I, I right now I'm studying technology Cypress. It's using mm -hmm. for EGE tests. Right. So I, I'm not finished yet, but once I finish, I can contribute with some automated tests for that topic. And and that's a Cypress is is in that Selenium and web browser space, right? It will drive exactly. And and there are there's even I would claim there's another layer in here which might be. API level tests of a full Jenkins, right? Where I call the REST API and test it heavily to be sure that everything behaves correctly behind a REST API call uh, without using a web browser. And, and then again, there are also things like in the Git plugin or Git client plugin, there's uh, Java, what is it, JMH performance tests, right? Which measure very specific performance or um, there is the other one, the, the Apache project. What's the Apache project that does, oh, how embarrassing. Ah, oh, JMeter, JMeter performance tests. Now those don't, I'm not aware of any of those that exist right now. These are very few and I'm not aware of any right now, in, but it's being discussed. How should we assess performance and scalability? Um, I'm not again, not very docs related, but for just activities, there's always uh, repro reproducing and creating test cases. Oh um, right. You know, I know we we haven't really ever talked about clearing Jira from on the on the whole the whole project side, but just being able to go through random ones and saying, you know, here's a Docker image, here's this pipeline that produces this issue goes a long way to getting something fixed. Yeah, good point. Um, oh, and Mark, we talked about this too, back to the one about the uh, pipeline steps is even just something that flags you've, you've coded a step or you've put a step in here and you've not documented it. Oh, right, right. That's a fun one. Uh, complain 
when a, when a new step arrives without documentation? I mean, right now, we know there's a bunch of them, but we can't really say out of all the steps that are supported and all the plugins, how many of them have documentation. Right. Well, or, or this one might be um, report the fraction, the, the number of args of steps with documentation, any documentation, and report the number of arguments with documentation just to track it. Right. And, and that's not a bad enhancement for a particular tool we already have. So interesting, interesting idea. And, and nice when somebody creates a new plugin that has steps in it, even if we do nothing, then, you know, give them a dirty look to tell them you, know, you have added three steps, none of which have documentation. Exactly. Is the, uh, it has its place. Is the pipeline generator run on the public infra or the private infra? Uh, it's... I think it's run on it that's a good be. question. I thought I thought it was because public. I was thinking about it. If you had a standard format, you could use the ng warnings tool to actually uh, parse right. that format and make graphs. Exactly. So could, yeah. Which and I think I think you hit it exactly, Gavin. There's no reason we couldn't make this look like J unit test results or something like that and get a, a graph from warnings ng. Yeah. And, and yeah, this is the thing. And it, in fact, is running on the public infrastructure. So it's visible there. And so here Mark, we have is it. Is there anything we could do to make it easier for people who develop um, plugins with steps to make it easier for them to document them? Would there be some sort of template we could provide them? Or, I mean, a, a blank screen is intimidating to a non writer. But I don't know if there's anything. I think it. It's very easy to start with right now. Uh, Kristen was was saying it's just the HTML file in your plugin to start with, right? Yeah, the most daunting part of that process for me is deciding deciding which directory the file should be put in, yeah, and what the name of the file should be. And it's it's a very rigorous pattern, but if I get the pattern wrong, I don't get the content. It might be too late to put it in this tool, though. It might be worth putting in the parent palm so that it won't even release, just like J Java doc stuff won't even release unless the file's there. The file can right. be empty, but the file has to be there. And and those those kinds of that's that's a much more bold step. But yeah, so parent palm. But once the file is there, then anyone can contribute to it. The like it's very hard for a non author to add a file that adds documentation it's just you don't know where to put it but if an author a plugin author puts the file there and says to do documentation or anything it's gonna be a lot easier for a third party to come in and help yeah ah, okay i see what you're saying it is if we were to populate with empty files or with even with a tbd file where it just has to be insert your text here uh, that would be probably be better for them. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting idea. Or like you said, with the um, improved docs links on the bottom of the page, like the generator could even just have a link into the, the plugin. This spot, this is where you create the file or something, you know? Right, right. I'm just, I'm tossing them out. I'm not saying any of them are any good, just throwing out ideas. I like uh, that's why we're here. Good. Okay. Well, actually, then we could give them something. I mean, I also see if I'm not in the habit, then I've got to go look and see how do I code a paragraph in HTML. We could actually give them a stub file that had a little bit of the basic coding that they need because they probably don't need very much, right? Paragraph, a list, maybe you're coming, you know, we could give them a stub file that they could copy and put into a file with this, with the right name. Well, and, and I think it's, I think you're on the right track. The, the actual layout of those files is pretty simple. It is, you do this, you put in a div marker, then you put in the some text about the step or, uh, or argument and you end the div marker and you're done. And, and we could fill that in as that could be the, the skeleton that's provided by this tool. Yeah. Now, now there will be some that will, well, yeah, it will generate some level of bitterness because, oh, I ran this tool, but then I never filled anything out. And now all my tech, my help is, is not terribly helpful. 
yeah, it didn't exist before. This is not much worse than non-existence. Right. Or, or okay, hey, we could even do this. Watch. Now it becomes invisible, right? It's just ah. a comment. But, but okay, good idea, very good idea. Well, Mark, related to this, maybe, um, and related to testing also, in case they would like to contribute, not necessarily in automating tests, but in manual or how we call it interaction mm -hmm. tests, right. verifying, for instance, the links or any other, um, um, well, some flavors in our documentation, that would be great as well. Right, uh, right. Very good. Yeah. So, well, confirm that the steps work and are clear. God, Vlad is tough, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I like good. that. Very good. All right, anything else on anything else on the project ideas? Thanks, yeah, Patty. I have. Oh, Jonathan, sorry. go ahead. Yeah, so it, it's related uh, on one talk we, we talked uh, some months ago and I started to contribute. So I'm just sending some links to provide an example for everyone. So for example, it's it's about uh, to, to keep our old version for our documentation, you know? Because for example, in, one, in the first stop there, Meg just suggests to update every everything, all images for new Jenkins version, you know? But there is a problem because if you, we just replace, everyone who needs the old documentation have no access to it because it changed. You know, so for example, another documentations, I, I just sent the project on uh, and, and the chat. So if you can just open it, please. There is two, two different approaches to resolve. So the first one, it's the JavaScript root, for example. So everything in, on the documentation had in the green on the top, the 3.1.5 version. So it's the, the listed version. And another version, it's keep in another page, for example, in the next, uh, oh, previous a snapshot. So for example, in the list, you can access the reference doc for documentations that verse plugin version. So it's an approach to documentations for, because for example, no, everyone it's in the top of versions. There is companies using old versions for Jenkins, for example, and another, I just was in JavaScript for give us an example, but there is companies that not it's on the update, you know? So you need to consider that, that problem because people just come through our site and, and we, we, we can't fi figure out what's the version. I, I'm just reading this documentation. So another example of solution, it's the first link I sent to you click it on the above the second. So for example, the first one, uh, these guys from Laravel, they just took a snapshot for entire documentation. So everything is changed. You just keep through it and, and just move it. And you can check the same things. How is two years, three years ago in the previous versions? So you can just check and, and sell yourself for information. So maybe it's a solution, so for example, Jenkins, now it's in kind of person how updates for the next version. Instead of to update the entire documentation, we can just create another repo and link in that in Mary page. So there is some useful for that idea. Yeah, so, so I think this aligns with what I've seen conversations, what I'd call it is version documentation um, documentation for the site. Yeah, attach our documentation for which Jenkins version. Right, and because, it's, yeah. And, and I think there, there are a number of examples that do exactly what you're illustrating. So just like Laravel does, if we look at Git, uh, they, have, they have versioned 
version. Let's see, let's do this. Man, git clone. Here we go. This one, for instance, right here. Choose Perfect. which version of Git you want to use. And, and oh, here it is. And it's, you can see evolution by looking, oh, wow, the arguments are different there than they are here. Yeah. So, yeah. so for true. example, it, it's a good thing for pipeline solutions because, for example, everything we have right now about pipelines, maybe it's out of date or maybe there is new parameters to Groove scripts and so on. But if you just arise, the people who need the old documentation, they lost information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the challenge for me with pipeline is, is that the, the version that I pick here, imagine this UI would have to be the plugin version or set of plugin versions that I'm using locally installed, not the Jenkins version, because, because we've got a, this dynamic surface that is Jenkins plus the set of plugins currently installed. And that's exactly what they get from their local installation. They, if they run Jenkins locally, they get help online locally that is exactly their plugin versions. Hmm. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I like the idea because I have used it. But I think unless you can keep your current documentation up to date, having out of date documentation to support as well as current is going to be a lot of work. Like, it's, you know, and then as as Mark pointed out, you got your plugin versions, you got your the different versions between plugins produce different syntax, you know, then you got, yeah, the different versions of Jenkins, then, you know, you got fixes, then you got new plugins. It's, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, I think, but on that note, there's no reason you couldn't link to archive.org. You know, have a, on each page, just have a link at the bottom that says, look at past results. And then and it just goes to the search bar and this like the last, I don't know how archive actually does it. That might be a good uh, escape clause when you have less volunteers. Mm. Yeah. The other issue is the structure, like the Git page that Mark pulled out, it's an old man page. And it's easy to do versioning on that. We have that pipeline syntax, which we call a reference page. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how in the hell would you version that thing? <laughs> um, and then oh. the steps, you know, I mean, these are, this is not, I've been, you know, I keep looking at those and trying to figure out how we turn those into something man page like. Um, yeah, so I think what you're saying, it's difficult to version, version the syntax of individual plugin pages um, with a single global version number, right? Because it would be for each specific plugin, that thing's version. Right. And then what would it be? There is, there's the plugin steps reference page that lists all the plugins and the steps that they provide, but then there's that other page that sort of common steps or something. Uh-huh, so that And I haven't even figured out what the criteria is for getting on that one. And it's arranged alphabetically, but it's basically in terms of doc format, it's a guide. Um, yeah, yeah, so, is so is this the one you're, des you're describing, Meg? I'm not sure. That's the pipeline syntax. Right, and then and steps look, is this there, one. It links to the two step references uh, up at the very, very top, okay. like the second paragraph at the top, or where was second paragraph? Where? Shoot, 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 shoot. Ah, the bottom paragraph of the first section, just above declarative for the uh -huh. pipeline steps reference. Right. Okay, and now that's that one, that's the auto-generated one. Now, mm -hmm. wait a minute, somewhere around here, there's another page. I'm reading slowly, go back to the pipeline syntax. And there is there is something up there. I believe the last line of the first paragraph, syntax comparison. Is that? Is that it? Don't know. I don't, no, this is, com bottom of this. that's comparing scripted and, and, and declarative. Getting um, started with pipeline maybe? Wait a minute, go back. I, I can't, I should pull my own copy. Um, 
and script. Oh no. Maybe go back to pipeline steps reference. Does that have something in there? I know it's here and I saw it fly by. I just didn't read it fast enough. Um, no, that's the step section. Shoot. There is another one that has the common, I think it has like write file and this sort of stuff in it. Maybe oh, it's, this it's, it's actually a plugin. So if you go, Mark, if you go back uh, to the, the full list, there's a utilities plugin and that's probably what you're thinking of. Uh, just look for right, 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 Jason. Uh, right, Jason. Yeah, so pipeline it's... utility steps. There. Oh, okay. This is actually a specific plugin that ha that implements a bunch of uh, pipeline. Oh, steps. so that is one plugin. Okay. But they do a good job. See, this I could see a man page for each one of these steps. Yeah. Uh huh. And then, then you could version that. Like versioning guide material is just dicey for all the reasons Gavin said and more. They just, but something like this where it's specific. Now, the interesting thing about this page, it, it is auto generated, but you can go back through all past uh, Jenkins, like the, the it releases and grab the, the HTML files from those releases and generate docs. Now it is doable. But I, I say that in this in the strong thing from the support side because I do a lot of support work. I want to encourage people to upgrade as much as possible. I don't want them running old versions, security issued versions, features that don't exist. I get, we get a lot of people that says, "Oh, I can't upgrade to get this feature." You're like, "Well, if you push that you want this feature, it's a good reason to upgrade." You know. So on one hand, I totally agree with having the docs as an end user. It's very good to be able to go back in time and see the past versions. But on the other hand, I want them to upgrade, get the latest version, get the latest docs, get the best features, get more eyes, get more bug reports, that kind of thing. So okay, I'm very so conflicted with it. religion, I will say too that like the drop down that Mark had, that's not my favorite. For man pages, I like towards the bottom, just above the see also section, uh, a section that says differences between versions. Yeah. Because most of these things don't change from version to version. So exactly. I find it really useful to say that at release such and such, we added this option. Or mm -hmm. we and that, uh, another another like nice thing about this doc Spring documentation, it's in the left the left menu, the side menu. Each one, it's kind of, a kind of plugin. So if you click above on, it's each one in different version of the Spring. Just click, uh -huh. just pick one. For example, oh, add that. Like click. Okay. Yeah. So it's 215 and there is the uh, previous documentation. So if you choose Apache Sol or Apache Geode, it's, an, uh, it's above another version. That so would be you nice can, too. Yeah. So it's putting the version, so if you, you the, the last tab you have open, just putting the version <laughs> number of pipeline utilities that was used to generate this. Ah, so ah. Yeah. Yeah. Here. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, for example, another thing I, I agree with Gavin say, of course, we desire everything up to date. But in the reality, inside the company, I'm the technician. I, I just tell with the people, look, guys, we need to update our environment, but we need to stay here the entire weekend. We need to upgrade several servers. We need to upgrade our scripts. So I lost the fight. Yeah. Because the people don't want to have tr a trouble with that. Just because there is no new amazing future in the next version, the next release. Right. But so, so, yeah. Okay, so so I think what, what you just described is if we were to add version number into this heading, for instance, would would that be, or, or someplace else on this page, it's in beginning because I, I'm in the previous version, but I'm reading the entire documentation to just realize, oh, it's the new one. I'm on the that. But yeah, I see three easy wins right here. One is getting the version number. Two is getting the link to archive.org for all old, old uh, docs. And three, get the link to the actual file in GitHub because that would also allow us to allow people to upgrade, uh, contribute easily, but also see the history. Like you can go back sure. and see, this file has changed 20 times in the last. So those would be three easy wins. 
and then the harder wins would be or the harder ones would be get a drop down to go back in time just because you have to publish this static file every single time which would mean each plugin so 1800 plugins times whatever 100,000 100 versions per plugin this that would be a mass amount of content yeah so i would say you can go for the easy wins right away and then if people start using them and liking them then you can start adding more of them into it it's a good strategy yeah good. okay so let me see if I and, can and, and 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 of course we, we don't need to documentation the past so we just need to just track now for the future okay so gavin it, the quick wins were include the Plugin version number. Sorry, I was trying to work at the same time. Uh, plugin page. version, uh, archive.org link. And, link uh, to archive.org for and, older pages, old copies of the page. And link to the GitHub, the file on GitHub. So like the improve this, but you also have diffs and, you know, which was Meg's comment. Yeah, so now, now file is a plural in this case because every argument gets its own file. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of compare version where it says compare two versions, you could have a something, I don't know. Layout is not my strength. I'm more on the technical side of all this, so. Yeah, so, so compare, well, compare versions has, has one, there's a file that provides this text up to, where's the first variable? Uh, up to there. And then there's another file that provides, provides this text and another one that provides this text and another one that provides this text. Yeah. So there are actually four files in okay. this in this one little thing, compare versions. It's definitely not an easy, easy win, but it's a doable win. Right, right. And and I think we have a tool that does this, right? There is a, there's a program that does yeah. this extraction already, the pipeline steps doc generator. So that tool could be extended. Cool, very good, all right. From sections of the pipeline steps. Actually, I wonder, huh, maybe I should put this in as a Google Summer of Code project, because why not? This is coding, right? This is absolutely coding. This is not writing documentation. This is truly a, a coding exercise and fits with some investigation people are already doing for REST API documentation. Good, okay. All right, anything else on, on project ideas? You've, you've been much more productive on project ideas than I ever expected. Jonathan, anything else from you? Did we cover the ones that you wanted to express? Yeah, it's covered. All right. Okay, next topic then, contributor onboarding. Uh, this is sort of the poster child for Vlad and and Jonathan and others who have had the the terrible bitter experience of trying to get started developing docs for Jenkins.io. So what Zenob reported is she had real difficulty doing development on Windows, and many many developers Windows is their machine. So if we make it difficult to develop on Windows, we've put a significant barrier to them creating additional help materials for us. Did you, do you have notes on what was the issues? Like uh, I she, think she, it was Docker based, right? Well, the discussed it with, with Oleg and Zinab in the session. And we suspect what it is, is that we have a combination of Docker based tooling that has dependencies on WSL and Oleg was able to get both WSL1 and WSL2 to work, but Zenob had failures on WSL1 and could not upgrade to WSL2 because her computer didn't support it. So, so she was hitting these barriers and Vlad, I don't remember what your experience was, but I think your Windows experience hit some similar challenges where you just switched to Linux eventually like I did. Uh, I yeah. guess on my Windows machine, I had WSL2 uh, and it didn't have these issues. But also, uh, originally, a long time, well, some time ago, uh, there were some issues of Docker on Windows. And yep. originally, the Windows was yeah. not supporting Docker. Yeah. But I so, 
in, in that, uh, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. The time just solved this problem to us. So, for example, now when I, I in the exactly moment when I start and I had trouble to build my local environment, uh, it's uh, it's just launched the WSL two. So my machine it's unable to upgrade to that mm. anyway. But now uh, that's solved. So most of Windows just uh, have the WSL two and the Docker just updated his last release and stopped to use Hyper-V. So there is a, a new, I can't explain with all details, but there is another kind of architecture that just allow you use everything without uh, this early problems. So mm -hmm. it's that prompt. And the other hand, the Docker toolbox, it's the Docker before, the Docker for Windows is just uh, depreciate. So there is no way to use it anymore. So if the people it's running on Windows 7 or Windows 10, the first versions, there is no solution for it. There is no Docker. So I just use need to use Docker in my Windows machine because they make command don't work well in no Linux environment. So because that, I just need to move for Linux or update for WSL2. But now, uh, as I said, everyone's it's a, a able to work on it and just update. And once you have the WSL2, there is only one cave rat to be aware. So for example, if people are working on WSL2, but put the source file in the Windows side, they some uh, issues there. So if people are using WSL2, you need to use the Ubuntu terminal, for example, to check out your environment. And once check out inside the Ubuntu, there is no problem. Just use everything as Windows side. So maybe put that information in the documentations could help a, a lot of people. Um, I can that, provide that, it. That is solvable, though. There is configuration with Git to solve that. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the, the synopsis where was if you're using WSL2 and Docker Hub, not any of the previous, or sorry, Docker Desktop, and not any of the previous versions, it should work just fine. Perfect. Um, yeah. But yeah. And, you know, I, I know we, I, the last meeting I talked about I said, do we want to switch to Gatsby? And then there's a note there that said, I don't know if that'll help. The reason I originally suggested it was that uh, JavaScript and Node specifically work really well in native Windows. Like you don't even need WSL for it. So that Whoa. was the only reason I was throwing it out there. Is like if we're go if we want to convert it away from the make file and the a doc and the Ruby and the weird sixteen different programs to convert things, that would reduce the amount of effort it takes to get people on board. Sure, sure, I agree. I agree. For example, I never use make in my life because I'm not a Ruby programmer and uh, not involved with it. I use Ruby, but as a regular user. And for example, I, it was really complicated in the beginning. It's also interesting because there's a thing called a rake file in Ruby, which would be cross-platform, but a make file is only in Linux-based systems. Yeah. Correct. It, so so the, the, the notion is that it's not it's not just it's not just a doc or ostruct it's that we've got tooling over the top of it that assumes a, a unix environment right and and it make make files are classically unix environment Very and cool. i and i know both environments really well i can help out but it's not my area of specialty so right what about isn't there now a, a linux you can run a Linux window in Windows. Yeah, that's what this WSL2 thing is. Does, can you work in Jenkins IO in that environment? And, and you can. Oleg has confirmed he does it all the time. Windows and Docker desktop. But the problem is Xenob can't run WSL2 on her computer. And she had problems with WSL1. So okay. it's just. Oh, the, the WS1 don't, didn't work. Right, and, and I not I don't recommend to use it. But right well, now I I'm I'm working on the version two. It's perfect. There is no me, problem. 
it does work. It just takes effort and it's less effort. <laughs> yeah. to, oh man. It takes less effort to <laughs> install Linux on top of Windows than it does to <laughs> install one. Right. So I've what? gotten it working, but I just, I run Linux most of the time anyway. So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't yeah. make a big deal. Right. Yeah. So what, what Gavin said is, Oleg was confident. He said, look, he made WSL one work, but I think the, the operative verb there is made, right? Yeah. Or we and, might word forced or, or coerced. And Docker also there was the issue, right? Because in WSL one, the, the glue was on the Windows side and WSL two, the, the glue is on, doc, on the Linux side. And that means the paths work properly in WSL two. They don't work right in one. You got to have all kinds of mapping, and custom support. It's it's doable, but not worth the effort. Um, dumb question. I don't do. I don't keep up with Windows at all. So, um, is in Europe and America how much? How many people are there that are stuck with WSL one and can't run WSL two? Is this largely an Africa problem? I I don't know. I would assume uh, it'll be CPU based. So like. You have to have the right CPU, the modern CPU. So it's hard yeah. to say. Yeah. And I think the entire, the entire world has the problem. The entire world. The young kids in Africa are getting the discarded machines from Europe and America. Probably. So, I mean, one, I, one thought is that, you know, we get like, at least for our people who, who get, you know, do the summer of code and stuff that part of the deal is, is we send them a brand new spanking new windows box. Or, hear me out, they, uh, we give them DigitalOcean credit and then they use remote uh, VS Code. Because uh -huh. VS Code over SS SSH is amazing. Mm. Actually, that's, that's not a bad idea. We have a writer in our group who is actually is an old Windows person and she's now being, you know, having to deal with this. She loves the GitHub editor. Yeah, that too. She did a whole bunch of her work with that. I mean, it drives me nuts because I want my VI facilities, but um there's also a new one code share code something that is a uh, editor in a box from github ah it's it's hosted but uh um yeah i i do i do all my work in vim too so i'm all linux shell stuff but with vs code there's actually a plugin for wsl docker and ssh where essentially it runs a tiny little binary on the remote system and then it communicates across that so you can re you can edit files remotely as if they were local so you could have all your tooling and everything else in vs code on your own computer but then it would connect to a remote machine and you could open the terminal you could run make you could run everything else and it would just it would work right if there's latency yeah. bit when you hit save but other than that it, it works and the issue of internet reliability in developing countries might be an issue too yeah but i mean that would only be so that only happens when you open and save the file the rest of the time the file is on your disk it's not like you're okay. running remotely right it's just when you hit save it sends it over the wire puts it on that disk ah hmm. yeah it's i i guess really it. slick it's perfect this would be a good project for she codes because they're there is to try out some of these different alternatives and help us mm. Yeah, I mean, yep. if, you, if you leave me to resolve this, I'm going to keep coming back. Just run a Linux computer and all will be fine. Yeah. Well, we were talking to governance. We do have some budget for these things too, right? And I'm sure we can get some sponsorship from various cloud providers that I won't name names for. Uh, right. But I mean, yeah, I'm not supposed to be naming names, right? Oh, no, right. you can but name names. To be rolling in dirt if, and desperately if... in need of some good PR. If, well, no, if... I work at DigitalOcean now, so it's... That's oh, okay. What yeah, no, no shame in mentioning a solution. But I mean, no works. I mean, yeah. So anything, any remote thing. So like the five dollar droplet at DigitalOcean would work perfect for this because it's you're editing files and then once in a while you hit make and that might take a few minutes to run make on a slow machine, but at least it runs, right? And then you mm -hmm. edit your files and you hit make again, and that means that anyone with a computer, a Chromebook, could run this because you can actually run VS Code actually as a website, you know? Huh? It's what? crazy what you can do with this stuff now. There is another, maybe another uh, solution for people with problem with Docker and WSL2. I heard some time ago, there is another Docker solution, the, the Podman. Then it works different in uh, Windows. So someone all right try it to create an image using the Podman. Oh, oh Podman, yes. Okay, Podman, so, yeah. Right, so, that's, that's so those again, are alt. 
alternate Docker creation facilities. Yeah, using but Podman, maybe. I don't think in this case it's the creation, it's the runtime that was the challenge, if I remember. Yeah, when I heard that the people just, I, I never tried Podman, but, but right. they just say they work in different way of uh, yeah. I would suspect it would still need Docker Desktop as a. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. I've never used That's it, just so I don't idea. know. Yeah, I, I've never heard of Podman or IMG being available for Windows at all, right? They so, are... IMG directly uses the low-level Docker APIs. Uh -huh. So it might run in WSL, but you can't run things in it. It can just write, create images with it. Right. Oh. Okay. So oh. they, I mean, I love, I love image, but image is all about creating Docker images without having root. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I definitely can help with some of this stuff, but it matters is just how much someone wants to spend time. The first, the first target user, right? You know, when that Kubernetes docs was being written, they didn't want to spend weeks setting up an infrastructure. They wanted to get it running. So, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and that it's fair, fair point. The fastest, the fastest path is exactly the path that Xenob took and that yeah. Meg described. Use Linux. Yep. Right. Actually, uh, AWS has the, we used it at one of our jobs. We used, can spin up a dev environment complete with a GUI, the remote terminal. And it, yeah, it sucks with slow internet, but it works. That's the thing is their, their technology is all like, uh, not peer to peer, but like stateless. So it works. If you get disconnected, you can reconnect easily. Right. And okay, so I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead Vlad. Uh, just I wanted to add about how to make it easier to contribute to Jenkins docs, uh, apparently. Besides, like, well, uh, 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 not, not related to Windows specific uh, uh, theme. Uh, I uh, look at what inspired me actually initially to contribute to Jenkins. And it was a series, I mentioned this already, I guess, before, series of one minute uh, video. Um, tutorials made by Lime about uh, uh, Blue Ocean. And so I think we have enough documentation, but there is lack of video materials, video tutorials, very short ones, uh, which explain how to make certain contributions, uh, which tools to use, how to use tools. So these videos, in my mind, should be very short, very precise, something, for instance, what uh, Gavin mentioned right now, how to use remote uh, VS Code uh, using digital ocean, or maybe separate it into uh, like different topics, uh, how to use visual code, how to get this, uh, uh, well, some kind of suggestions, but it may be not related to visual code at all, how to contribute to documentation, what to do, what tools to use, and so on. And it will be also contribution to documentation and at the same time, uh, enabling them to use uh, infrastructure uh, for uh, like enhancing now Jenkins experience. Well, just a thought about how to make it easier to contribute. I, I love that. So I, I have a story to tell on exactly that example. My story to tell goes like this. I'm tired of people complaining that they don't have enough examples of pipeline. <laughs> and that's the most common complaint on our, on our pipeline reference material is give me more examples. I think what they really mean is I need to write the pipeline. I need an easy way to do it. And they don't know about the syntax generator, about the snippet generator. So I did a 90 second video exactly. on the pipeline snippet generator and exactly. posted it in the Git plugin page. Exactly. And it and was beautiful, Mark. It was yeah. beautiful and it was it, it's it's actually terrible, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> and oh, and it. being better it. than nothing, it has hundreds of views in the week and a half or two weeks it's existed. So I, I, I didn't I, I didn't promote it on social media. I didn't do anything except embed it in that site. I need that link because I it, it comes up all the time in in IRC where someone goes, "Hey, uh, I tried to do this thing," and I'm like, "Well, did you check the syntax generator?" They're like, "Yes." I'm like, "Did you click the link on the side?" They're like, "No." I'm like, "Then you didn't use the syntax generator," you know? So right, exactly, and that was that was the motivation here. So it's this thing 
right here, and it says, this 90 second video clip introduces Pipeline Syntax Snippet Generator. And now I, I cheated and added one more, a 30 minute video from, from Darren Pope with his permission, but 90 seconds. And I think that the test there was, and if we look at it, let's see how many views it's had now. 400 views since the 3rd of February. So we are three weeks in and it's been viewed 400 times. Yeah, wow. but if you remember, Mark, uh, some time ago we discussed about published video in, in Jenkins channel. And uh -huh. we, we just have a problem to validate the video content and to add new contributors for channel, Jenkins channel on YouTube. There is right. some progress on that. that because you, because the, the problem was check all videos we receive, how to approve it. How, uh, it's about the workflow to receive videos, tutorials. Correct. We, and, and in fact, that's a good point. We don't have a way. That's a very good one. We have no uh, workflow currently to submit a video to the Jenkins channel. Yeah, I remember we need to check how to create con uh, new publishers, add new publishers inside the YouTube platform, but it's not so well fit for Jenks Desire was the, the answer I received. I'll, oh. I'll do, oh, go ahead. No, I slightly, it's just you reminded me of something. So go ahead and I'll, I'll finish when you're done. So the, the, I think we could link to, we could create that process and link to other channels from from the Jenkins channel. So there is a there is a playlist in Jenkins right now called other people's interesting content or something, which is is play is videos that are Jenkins related but not in the Jenkins channel. The other is we could just set up a workflow process to allow us to review videos and upload them. There are there yeah. are several of us that have permission, but we haven't we haven't defined it yet. That's good. Yeah. That that is one way, and another way, for example, from Jenkins account from YouTube, you can create a a sub channels. So you can create, for example, a sub channel just called community channel, Jenks community channel, and oh. that channel you just add everyone who are, are 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 approved to publish video. For example, all we are here in in this meeting, for example, could be receive a role of publishing and you will have authorization to publish new videos there once the video is approved for three others people so it's a kind of process yeah so you can use the ju just a a sub channel and for example as vlad said you can create small videos and just publish good okay excellent um so, by sorry, the way I can't. Meg, I'm, I'm going to put you on pause, Meg. No, Gavin no, no. was next in the queue. No, no. Gavin? I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I might, I'm going to derail this conversation, so I'm more than happy. Oh, okay, Meg, back to you then. That's great. Um, I, mine is quick. Um, I can't tell you how long I documented the snippet generator and steps, et cetera, before I figured out that those were tied together. And if I go to the steps reference pages, there's nothing up at the front that says if you're having trouble with this syntax. Um, here it is. There is also not a reference that says if you want to know what steps are available on your Jenkins instance, do this. Now, now, wait a second. I am going to I am going to challenge your assertion because there is at least one plugin that that <laughs> very much because I got so annoyed at having to describe this over and over again. This thing says use the pipeline snippet yeah. snip generator. Yes. Use the pipeline. But a single a single plugin saying that doesn't count as. The doc's having it. <laughs> Man, Meg, Meg, you are searching size that time we talk about for this page. <laughs> right. I'm, I, let's, it's Mark, a detective. Mark, not all code, not all um, uh, plugin developers are as erudite and kind as you are. We should <laughs> make a model of you and put it at the top of the freaking page about all of the steps. Well, we have that we have that issue on on IRC all the time. Someone will come in and be like, uh, "I created this a thing with an input file parameter and it's not working." And you're like, "Well, do you have the input file parameter installed?" And like, "No." And like, "Then why why are you using this this thing?" And the thing is, they go to these docs, copy and paste it, and expect it to work, not right. knowing that the plugin also has to be installed. And you're like, "You have to go to the syntax generator to see what 
format your server supports. So I'm very much in favor of that getting more bigger, better. In fact, it should it should be like a 42 inch font at the top of the page. <laughs> That's right. Don't be stupid. Use the generator. <laughs> I wasn't going to go that mean, but yes, I was thinking it. Uh, okay, um, cool. Going back slightly, uh, videos. Uh, so I, I, I do like the idea of having more videos and I, I like having them around. The problem with videos is they get out of date very, very quickly and they're almost impossible to update, right? Because you have to free film. Um, but that being said, I have heard of there is tooling out there that can create videos as code. So you essentially give it a bunch of like screen commands and it's, it's more like a screencast than an actual video, but it can actually re recreate videos for you on demand. And I don't know what it's called, but I have seen them out there. I know they exist. Wow. Oh, and, and with narration or is this just, do it I might then put be the one audio of, track over it? It might be one of the newer like text to, text to speech narration type things, but I don't know. I like, this is not my area of expertise. I just know that one of the companies I worked at or one of the open source projects I had had made it. I, in fact, if I were to randomly guess, I would say Jess Fraz, because she makes the weirdest tools on the internet, the best tools. I would say that something she had, some demo site had that. Hmm. Interesting. I think that sounds fascinating. Because that would make a difference, right? Because uh, any video you make, I would say in like a week, it's out of date. You know, we might yeah. change the UI, you might change a plugin release, might have bug fix. And that's the problem with linking videos everywhere. Right. I would also add a more mundane, cause I'm a more mundane person. Um, even ha making sure that every video says what version yep. of all related software is in there. At least I know if this is old or not. Yeah, some things, if you decide to use video, you, you need to just create the template. So this is the, the introduce. So you need to explain which version is, which navigation navigator you are using, which environment you are working on, Windows, Linux, and so on, and, and just put the data on the recorder to, to tell the people, look, man, this is video for three years ago. So it's really really up to date and out of date subtitles are, must be mandatory because otherwise accessibility is an issue yeah to to subtitles i, I work in a project or i call it amara.org and that we can create uh, subtitles for videos so for example if you if you decide to use uh videos we can once publish the video we can just uh, set, uh, send to Amara the link, and uh, the another volunteers could create uh, subtitles. I used to practice my English. It's really Damn good. You, Mark. I don't know how to do it. I've never done that before. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, so, I have cool. I have friends on the website that are big into accessibility, and they talk about mm -hmm. all the things. And you know, I have friends who are deaf, and they get so pissed off at videos that have no subtitles. Right, and my Molly, Sorry. Oh, sorry. So sorry. I just think I in the loud. Yeah, but I mean, I, it's not hard to add them. I mean, even if worst case, the auto generated ones will work, but you gotta. It's better to have actual proper ones with the right, especially tech videos which have terms that don't get translated very easily with auto generated. So. Yeah, I, I, that sounds like a great experiment. I'd love to try it on that little pipelet syntax snippet. It ninety seconds of of adding subtitles is not that much. I can almost type fast enough to keep up with 90 seconds. Good, okay. Others on, uh, let's see, our general topic is contributor onboarding. Other suggestions? So one of Oleg's observations was outreach programs are the single most crucial thing is getting people into the project. And he suggested a UX hack fest like we did last year or bribery, uh, oh, sorry, uh, incentives. <laughs> Get a t-shirt if you contribute this many documentation pull requests or something like that. The challenge with that one is it's the classic Hacktoberfest challenge, right? How do you quantify and how do you make it so that the contributions are net positive to the project, not net negative? 
Uh, Gavin, somehow or other, you went silent. I think, that, I think there's an even higher thing. I think there are people out there who are just too shy to join in, that we need a different sort. We need a different sort of messaging into different sorts of groups. Mm. And I, we've already talked, I mean, every, there's, there's a zillion things going on now for under um, represented groups have all their tech groups reach out to them and explicitly invite them say we are we are nice people not all open source communities are as nice as jenkins is there's a couple that i touched in and it's like no life is too short i wouldn't I even say most of this. most of jenkins is as nice as the docs huh i wouldn't even go as far <laughs> to say that. i think the docs is nicer than anything else at jenkins so. true well docs <laughs> is always nicer than the software um sorry what i was gonna shoot on that note too. Uh, I do know that DigitalOcean does have, uh, oh, right. Uh, any contribution is a good contribution. I don't like the whole Hacktoberfest controversy about bad contributions. Mm. There were ones that were obviously spam, but I think there's, there's a difference between spam and bad contributions. Any contribution is a good contribution. It gets you started, even if it's not accepted. Yeah. Ah, um, okay. And it's right. yeah, like okay. thousands of dollars we're giving them a you know ten dollar t-shirt yeah um also but yeah, it is I, something you do need oh, to sorry. you should reach out to digital ocean on this one this one i can specifically say because they have programs specifically for contributing docs now most of them they want tutorials for their website but they do have open source uh programs for creating docs so this, this would be something that's worth reaching out to them for any event you want to do Another nice thing I, I experienced in uh, another community I participate, it's uh, some time ago, I, I was a student uh, game programming. So for example, I, I sent a, a sample of link in the chat, if you could open that. Mm. Okay. So in that special occasion, occasion uh, everyone is just uh, uh, learn together about this engine called the food and they create this kind of budgets. So for example, there is a gamification behind the contribution. So for example, if you create a new page, you receive a star and there is inside of your name inside the project. So mm -hmm. the first, as you can see, is a sample of the get started budget. So it's a program. So each new member, for example, the first mention the first link you publish in the two, the first edition page you do in the documentation uh, engine, engine, and the reading, reading guidelines. So for example, when you just read 10 pages, there is several ways to, to uh, uh, manage that. But it's a, a kind of uh, program to, to track every contribution. So for you can say, for example, when you just uh, contribute with 10 pages, you receive a t-shirt from Jenkins, for example. So it's kind of uh, benefit attached for the contributions. Mm. Yeah, so hang on, let me capture that. So it was uh, badges, and I think we had had badges mentioned somewhere else, badges. So that, while well, you're typing, that list of badges is actually built into the form software, the discourse form software. But oh. there's also uh, uh, X Mozilla project that got transferred away called uh, Badger, which is back in those days where everything had a vowel on the end. But Badger, uh, B-A-D-G-R, there's no E. So badge er. Uh, but it's a spec that you can generate uh, badges and then they can be, impl they can be imported into your badge uh, in various different websites have it. So I think there's badger.me or something. Let me look it up quickly. Yeah, so I, I remember uh, and the first event I participate, the Oleg or, or, or Chin, I don't remember, just create a page and put our picture there. So for example, you contribute to the same page, so it's kind of that. But right, instead, right. Of, instead of just related in one event, related for entire Jinx. Mm -hmm. So everyone, it's a volunteer, there is a specific static page, for example, for attach, uh, they get account, and we can just add budgets for the uh, the people. 
So each event, there is a majority a budget. And if you participate, you just receive a, that medal and another medal for another contribution. If you send 10 videos for us, you receive another budget. But the Jenkins holds, holds a, a page for volunteers mm. to, to publish our steps inside the community. Good, yes. All right, so um, Gavin, I missed one item in your, you'd mentioned Badger and before that you'd mentioned another, it was the, I think it's the, the collaborations or the uh, messaging software you use. So the one that um, Jonathan had opened is, is Discourse. Oh, Discourse. Okay. So that's what generated that list of badges. I see, okay. And then, yeah, so BADGR is the uh, spec, which is what you have up there. Got it. All right. How would we tap into university students, too? Mm, good question. Because I'm thinking, I mean, there, I, I don't know how you'd set it up, but but you have students there who are doing all this theoretical stuff, and they really could use some real world experience of how you go in and you know with an existing project and code and you make a contribution and you get it reviewed and tested and stuff and for them they'd be delighted with anything that they can put on their resume that makes them more interesting to employers mm -hmm. um short answer okay. there is get chatting with teachers you know from your extended network because there's no i've not heard of any single central source for this. It's just, you got to find right. the teachers that are good teachers. But there's got to be, I'm thinking it's also a good time because a lot of like comp sci majors got that with summer internships, et cetera. I don't, I yep. don't know how many internships have happened with COVID, you know, because of all the travel restrictions. So this would be something sort of an equivalent to that, you know, some, some way that everybody who's walled off in their own little rooms could get some real experience. Um, or maybe yeah. find some example of using Jenkins at some university uh, process, uh, how they automate, automate CI, for instance, or CD, and try to propagate it to other universities or campuses. Well, this may be a good as well approach uh, something like Facebook started at one university and after that they went to another university and so on uh, in case if there are some examples of using Jenkins at university in one of you know, like teaching processes uh, mm -hmm. hosted by some university I don't know if we have okay. this information or not and that idea fits well that's one that this whole reaching out to universities is one that advocacy and outreach just discussed two or three hours ago. So very good idea. Yes. Out, um, and they'll, the plan is to do it for for next 12 months. I, I feel like Meg's comment was less about getting them to document their use as well as, as much as getting them interest in open source and contributing. So they have oh. working uh, like examples for a resume for a portfolio that said, hey, I contributed this way. Right. So rather than telling their story, it's encouraged them to use Jenkins for their own coursework. Well, no, uh, like, uh, you know, if you can't get hired unless you have experience, so often open source work on a resume is good. So contributing docs, contributing bugs and fixes, this, it's less of a doc specific to topic and more of just getting people involved in the De Jenkins project at the university level. Good, right. okay. Yeah. For universities here from Brazil, there is a, a requirement, for example, each course uh, needs to have 200 hours for side projects but so every brazilian student stay crazy looking for opportunities to get that hours but the institution who where the student participate should emit a, a simple certificate just saying look jonathan participate from jenkins for 40 hours so that i can take that document and just 
deliver in my university. So if we can provide a digital paper, a, a document, just saying the people helped us for a month of hours, that it's a kind of thing that uh, interests for Brazilians, students. Because they need side projects to, to get uh, uh, finish the, the, the course. Interesting. Okay. That's yeah, that's it's a, it's different. a government requirement to, to get certificate in any university course. So the question is, there's got to be some association of people who teach computer science in universities. There are groups for everything, and that's well, sure. Like we need to sure. There's the associate the ACM and ask them how we could get, you know, how we could work with them for mutual benefit. There's Association for Computing Machinery, and they have chapters in most universities, at least in the U.S. Right, I Triple E probably still does too, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Because I'm also thinking, I mean, the real wealth, like the Stanford and MIT, everybody's looking at them, the probably going for like the second tier universities would mm. be, we'd find some real interesting because nobody's interested in them and their students and they anything that would get them some real experience and exposure could be a positive thing. Don't forget high schools. High right. school, like I don't know about U.S., but in Canada, you needed so many volunteer hours to graduate high school too. Mm -hmm. That's true. Which, which is a lot harder to get during COVID. Yes. Okay. Good. Others. Okay, I think going to close. Call contrib contributor onboarding done for the moment. And on to the next topic. Google Season of Docs 2021. So Season of Docs this year is different. Um, we're, we are in the concluding month before the application deadline. So that's that's a, a complex complexity that the Docs SIG and the Jenkins project would like to address. We'd like to be part of Google Season of Docs 2021. However, the uh, payment model has changed. They now pay us as a project and we choose the writer and hire them and pay them from the project with the money that Google provides. So I've got an action item to find the money we got from last year that they gave us, but apparently didn't arrive all the way in our account. And uh, so we need project ideas and we need mentors to support those ideas. Thus, the question to you, what project ideas would we do with a Google, Google summer of season of docs? Uh, it seems like the same thing, see the she code Africa ideas. Any others that you'd like to recommend? Well, we have in our documentation, current documentation, we have just uh, uh, several empty spots. Uh, for instance, there is empty spot for different tools which we're using, and I guess it is mentioned in our um, uh, one of our sections on Jenkins.io, where we mention like uh, build tools, I guess. Uh, 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 how to control those tools from Jenkins. Mm. Uh, and we have this item in the uh, table of contents, but it is empty pages for all these tools. So um, trying to fill out empty spots in our documentation would be one of the possible additions. Good, yeah. So polish the Polish and complete the things. I, my my classic example backup page is empty. Right? Really, we're not telling people how to do backups, but it's a complicated task. That's um, probably three or four weeks of documentation to describe that one well. I don't know. Backup is such a mess. 
<laughs> exactly. That's why. Yep. I mean, I guess I'm th well. I'm saying that there, it's more than a documentation problem, though. I mean, there are. I mean, you know, we've got 22 backup plugins, none of which are owned. And you know, I, I, can I just say, you use DigitalOcean snapshots, and you won't have this problem. Yes. That's mine is, oh, just use a snapshotting file system. And I'm done. Doesn't that, does, doesn't my free BSD that does snapshotting file systems just work? And Amazon snapshotting file system and Google. Yep. All in favor of snapshotting file systems, but we don't even tell people that. I can submit a PR right now. Use DigitalOcean. Submit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And we've had we've had mention of ZFS file systems for years in the product in in the code. Finally, got rid of a bunch of them. Of uh, but but snapshot based file systems are a great way to to do backups. Yep. Okay, you're, you're quiet. That's that's okay. So next topic was. I'm wondering about, I'm thinking about, skip down to the bottom of your agenda for a second, that last one about architecting. About is that something we're ever going to get to in a meeting, the documentation, inventory, and reworking proposal? We, is that we will we could break up into pieces for Google Summer of Docs. I don't think we can break it up because it presupposes people like in this group who are familiar with Jenkins and, and with ready and willing That's to have this would, conversation. That's so, what I was hesitating about, but yeah, I think I think that's a good one for us. But for me, the way I'm going to describe it is that it's one that will happen in the doc sig periodically and systematically as we look at slices of this step at a time. Right. Jonathan Jonathan started us on it, did a great job of of getting that started. We just we've got an awful lot to go through and need to to look at it as a general exercise and having multiple people in those conversations is really good. Right. That's what I was just trying to figure out if there was something there that could be done as Google, but cancel the idea. Yeah, I, I think the problem there is, is there are so many things that need context that I, I, if we handed it to somebody inexperienced, they will make it, well, Daniel Beck has noted on occasions, we've made things worse rather than better. When we've when we've translated from a wiki page into Jenkins.io because the content that arrived was not well enough reviewed by the reviewers, and we just have to be careful. Of right, there'll be somebody who says, "Oh, we shouldn't be using ASCII doc; we should be using RST or so." Yeah, right. never mind. Um, okay. Back to the university stuff. Uh -huh. I was just sitting here, and just for the hell of it, I um, googled computer science professor or checked for that in LinkedIn. It's not working so well. But it occurred to me that we could put a posting on LinkedIn about that the Jenkins Open Source Project was interested in working with university faculty to get oh. their students involved in contribution or something and let some professors come to us who would be interested in, because that would be, that would help our mentoring if they had professors on campus. Mm. You know, we can support the professors, but put some of the responsibility back on the professors to find the students and help them out with some basics. Good, good suggestion. Good idea to the advocacy group as well. Yeah. Advocacy I, can use the same idea. I generally feel like anytime you expect someone else to do work for you, it won't get done. And, and I think I think I can accept that. Right. Yeah. In this case, but if they it won't make it worse. Right. right. Even if you well, get one person do something for them. Yeah. We're, yep. we're offering the professors a way to get their student. I mean, we're going to help with the mentoring. We're not turning it over to them. Yes. No, I, I understand. I'm just, I'm, I'm always worried about the, hey, by the way, you should find someone to come talk to us. And I'm like, I agree. That sounds great. But in, re, in, in principle, I mean, and it, there's no harm in doing it. Right. But I right. also, you also got to expect nobody to reply because it's like they have to do three steps to get to us. Mm -hmm. Right. But I'm also, I'm thinking there's some people that, you know, we pose it, you know, that what we, you know, we'll work with you and we'll give yes. your students this opportunity and, you know, we'll work with you to help with it. Um, but that's also why I think high school should be included in this. Yeah. Educators, right. 
Yeah, high school. Yes, educate. I shouldn't just say you. I, I actually I loved my high school education with a computer terminal, so it was great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just learned recently that uh, high schools are doing robotics. Like it's uh, just something that, like, when I went to high school, none of that would have even been considered, and now it's commonplace. So we should be reaching out early and, and quickly to get people involved in open source. Mm -hmm. But I, let me throw just one question. Uh, what do you think? Is it possible to have like two-way uh, contribution with all these teaching organizations, university schools? For instance, they provide students contributing to Jenkins, and we, let's say, help them organize um, or teach them how to contribute to GitHub by organizing or helping organize infrastructure. Yes. Uh, in case we want to. Very uh, much, yes. Uh, I think we have a good example. Uli Hafner, a member of the Jenkins Governing Board, is a university educator in Germany. And he uses Jenkins in his coursework. They actually do development efforts on Jenkins, or they have in the past, using Jenkins for as part of the development coursework. So it, absolutely, I think it can. It's just, I'm confident if we ask him, he'll tell us it's a lot of work, yeah. just like any software creation is, right? It's a I lot mean, of work. I also teach JavaScript, you know, before COVID times, I teach JavaScript and a half the time you have to teach GitHub at the same time. So I think that's totally within reason is if we want to get people to help us write docs or any contribution whatsoever to Jenkins, we should also be willing to help them learn modern software practices and how to use Jenkins and how to do CI. Like it's a definitely a two-way street. It's not you giving us work for free. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Good. every time you help someone, you learn a lot. So it's definitely not, it's both ways. Yeah, okay. Right. Did you forget how different the university world is from the world we're in? Yeah, I'm seeing it just as opening a dialogue with people who are interesting. What would you like to do? And what could we do for you? And what could you do for us? And we might have, you know, Vlad said a couple of options. We could have, you know, 50 different professors and 50 different arrangements, but. Mm -hmm. And docs doesn't necessarily mean writing documentation. It can mean, you know, those, the tooling, the infrastructure, hell, I, I need help on the plugin site. You know, it's always other things that are not docs that are docs related. So, right, right. And as I say, you know, um, but actually, I think we send a good message to we forget how radical I mean, in in our community and in several other the open source communities, the idea of documentation as code and trying to do similar policies, that's not real common. And that, you know, so that we're out there advertising that we're looking for both software and documentation. We're looking for software and documentation experts and this sort of stuff, you know, and that it's all sort of the same. Um, whether you do software or documentation, it's all going into GitHub. It's all going to have to be tested. It's all going to have to be reviewed. Um, and you're all going to have to behave by the same code of ethics and all of this stuff. They're not right. silos. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Anything else on the on the outreach and Google season of docs? Okay, so we are now at we've only got 30 minutes left. I propose we skip the next two so that we can spend time talking about site search. Gavin, are you okay with that? Yeah, with Gavin here, definitely. Jonathan, Gavin, Gavin are both deeply interested in this, so let's talk. So, Gavin, do you want to first talk about why don't you share share the story and what you've learned, etc.? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you keep telling me to share what I learned, and it keeps putting me on the spot. I haven't learned anything yet. It's only been a day. Okay, okay. Gavin has um, not learned anything. Nothing, but he's learned going nothing. to tell us about his experience. Um, <laughs> I, I will say I'm, I'm very impressed overall with Argolia, like flat out across the board. Uh, it was, I mean, I followed a tutorial on Gatsby and Agolia, but honestly, it was straight up easy to do. It's uh, essentially an API for you upload uh, metadata to Agolia, and then you turn around and search. So I'm going to use Mark as a demoer while I talk. So can you pull up the thing? Sure. Uh, so the let's go to the Jenkins pop plugin, the plugin site. site, but also the Agolia login thing. Oh, oh right, Agolia. So we want. Yeah. So uh, what happens 
on the tech side is every time we build this plugin site, we upload the metadata for every plugin into Agolia. Now it's by far the least efficient way to do it, but it works. It was very easy to prototype. Uh, if you go to indices, it's actually the best one for this thing. Indices, okay. So what happens is you can see here in that big box there, that's every single plugin. So if you open up the more attributes section, uh, dismiss More that. attributes, where is uh, more middle, attributes? middle page, it should say show more attributes. Okay. So that's the entirety of a plugin as data as we know it. You know, it has stats, it has a current install, categories, labels, maintainers, that kind of thing. Uh, inside of Golia, you can mark each and every field as searchable or non-searchable. So in this case, uh, I made it say, okay, you can search by label, you can search by category, you can search by maintainer, and we want the wiki content. We don't really care about the expert excerpt. We don't really care about the version or required core. Although Mark and I learned earlier that some people search by version, so we might want to add that in. Yeah, um, but all this data is just metadata, right? It can be anything, it can be any single value. And then on top of that, they have their own dictionary. So if you go scroll to the top, there's configuration. This is where it gets really, the second tab there, it gets really powerful. So there's like typo tolerances, language, synonyms, stop words. So all the things that people can search for, like they can, um, uh, what was the typo that you found the other day that was really good? Uh, I typo, I don't you remember. You found it was a word that you typed one thing, uh, I think it was a plural and you got a singular back. Right. Oh, like, yeah, strategy and strategies, right. Yeah, exactly. so it has all these things built in without us adding them in. And this might get overridden, so don't worry about it. It might yeah, be I'm just going, might, yeah. Okay, master is yeah. a synonym for controller. Yeah. So, and now how do I, oh, and I so probably put it like this. Probably. You okay if I, I save not, it? I haven't, yeah, go ahead. I haven't done any of this yet, so. Okay, but then if you go. Yeah, there we go. So, and then if you go to browse and you type in master, it'll actually tell you. <laughs> now for the plugin site, this data isn't very useful, but you see as you type that in, uh, it actually highlighted what was thing. So you can see title there, it highlighted master. So you can mm -hmm. actually do expose that information to the front end as well. So a user types in master, it could be like, oh, your word was found three quarters of the way through the paragraph. It's probably a less good search. You know, like all that stuff is all configurable, exposable. Um, I'm really excited about this. So, you know, I've spent a week now just playing around with the features and got it working. But with minimal configuration, we got way better search. You know, the fact that I can now search for digital ocean and not get blue ocean makes a big difference. You know, uh, I, I figure out, I, 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 you remember, Mark, we are talking about why another community site using Albolia. I believe yeah. it's because that kind of information. Yeah. yeah, so Mark, you and I may have to sit down and look at this, and I think it might have to be done on the, config, on the code side, just oh, because okay. every time we create the index, it replaces it. Oh, but, um, <laughs> that's just because of the way I implemented it. Right. Well, right? It, but just knowing that the concept of synonyms exists is yes. already so cool. Yeah. And then yeah. analytics and we barely even do any analytics and we were having, we were having fun with that in the last meeting, right? You can do, you can see what the searches are and you can see how many searches for what people search for. You can tell Mark and I have searched for the word ocean a lot. <laughs> Um, but like even searches that result is very useful because we learned that, yeah, people are searching for version numbers in, when, in the site. You know, we don't have that exposure right now. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of us with, uh, I have Google Analytics support now so I can see what the main Jenkins site has, but I don't think this, any of this data is, re, is surfaced in the Jenkins IO site right now. Right. You know? yeah. hey, so David. What if you search for code coverage? Is it going to find me the the plugins and the steps that would give uh, go back to indices coverage. or go indices. back to the plugins like directly. Yeah. So, okay. So let's do code coverage. Whoops. Yeah. You Seriously. It. I mean, code. So this is an example of the instant search mark. So we could do this in the actual UI as well. But so, yeah. so Meg to, to show the real evidence, here we go. Code coverage. API yeah. and code coverage. Now, oddly enough, it doesn't show warnings ng, right? And for me, I would have, I would have thought that we would put a label on warnings ng that talks about coverage because it can report coverage. Well, so that's why you go back to that UI. Back here. Yeah, you do coverage. So how many did it find? Right. It found two. 
So it probably uh, returned four, actually. Is that oh, interesting. So by adding the word code, I narrowed it too much. Yeah. Ah. And it also, uh, right now, because of the, my implementation, it only looks at the first 2,000 letters, I think, of the documentation. Mm. Uh, just because it, there is a limit to how much content you can feed it. And it, it's configurable, but there is a limit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gavin. There is something you figure out in Algolia that, for example, could become a project on Google Season of Docs. Because, for example, you need to uh, chant something inside the documentation to improve the search engine. A, a little for bit. For example, we need to move the, we need to start to use H1, H2, H3 to create the talks, for example. There is something like that. Nothing I had to do involved that, but I'm sure there is okay. it. If Mark, so if you go to the configuration tab again and look at uh, the second configuration second, tab, okay. Uh, searchable attributes. I had to configure this to make sure it was searching the things I cared about and mm -hmm. ranking and sorting to make sure that it said, okay, take all of the, the, the word searches and then failing that, look at the current installs. So that means that if you look for Git, it's going to have the highest number of installs. So it's going to show up earlier than a new Git plugin that matches slightly better on text you know that's the only configuration i really did right but it's okay. all configurable like even if you expand that textual one it's very configurable so you could be you could have like uh location-based words and how close the words are together matter and all that other stuff typo tolerance is interesting yeah why can't you figure out what i meant to type <laughs> it can though <laughs> that's what i know all the time i'm typing something it's like well, it was obvious what i meant yeah so I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, Olivia and I will look into getting the open source thing set up for plugins, but they have it very well documented uh, how they're going to support open source. So you don't have to like be a one-off sponsorship. So, so far I'm very impressed by this. Um, I think we can have up to 20 users uh, and especially read only users. So I think if we, if Mark, if you decide you want to have some more users in here, I don't think it's an issue, but let's wait till we get open source uh, account set up first. Right. Yeah, and again, from... all the configuration is done in code now anyway, so it's a simple PR to reconfigure it. Right. So, so, but for me, the, the thing is absolutely, it, this is a thing of beauty. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Really? Yeah, the, best, the, the, the best thing about this is it's this, the, the stats information. So yeah. based on the next search, we can decide how to improve in our site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really specific. So... That's another reason I believe another community like Laravel and Vuetify that I suggested some time ago are using Algolia. And they their documentation, it's amazing. Everything you need is inside there. So it's a, I believe using Algolia, you, you really help us to improve more and more. And it will matter a lot more for the actual doc site. The plugin site has a lot more metadata, so it's a little bit harder to quantify this. But it's a lot, lot less risky POC, right? Because we already had search, we already had all the features. Like you know, Mark, you and I talked about adopt this plugin. You could, you could already search by label before. It just didn't return well results. So it was a low risk attempt. I think it went by real fast. But did I see that when you did the search that over in the left there was a place where it said this is from the admin guide and this is from this guide, or something, which uh, is sometimes nice. Well, like I'm searching for there's... a term and it's. There's a categorization. So yeah. these these yeah, categories those, those haven't we, been updated in like five years. Right. So so the, the categories are at times dismayingly empty. Like let's pick what's man, that's not bad, four or five, but but there are times when it's well, let's see, if this if I remember it was this one. No, nope, no, nope, this one. There oh, actually I'm getting good results. So that's actually great. if you go to Agolia and look at the uh indices you can actually see the categories and how many are you in each so if you get rid of the text in there get rid oh right get rid of that okay it'll it'll tell you those are the categories oh, those got are it three. okay i think those might even be the top categories but there's 72 labels and none of them are surfaced and you, well i mean they're in the plugin site but so that's something i want to improve so that this like it should be very easy to see that adopt this plugin and search yeah. for them and for, uh, Gavin, I, I saw your first demo. The, you you found some company that 
allow to us create something like that. I, I sent another link in, in the uh, chat. Right? Did I? Yeah, just for example, in the, the search field, just type select, just type select. Yes, so, no, Agolio so, will do this. Yeah. Five yeah, so you have right. the section, the sec yeah, the sections. I made I made the search thing myself because of how the plugin site works. But if you go to mm. Agolia demos, I think if you just Google for it, you'll find yes. all of these and they provide yeah. them out of the box. You can just import them. Though they have a JavaScript review, uh, React yes. one. So it all yes. comes out of the box. So like, for example, Mark, if you have this kind of search bar in our documentation, the people just type coverage. They they can access all sections that talk about coverage. So it's really useful to to search documentation. Yeah. What I'm thinking is when we start going through the docs and looking at the structure and all of that architecture, um, because the docs do not have any categories assigned like the plugins do, right? Right. Kind of. And the, I don't you know, know. I, I would I would call this thing on the left here. They have a section. That's kind of a category. Right. I would call the section the closest thing we have to a category, right? Installing, using, pipeline. But is that that's not what you meant, I think, Maggie. No, I'm thinking, well, well, I mean that's not I'm not saying throw that out. Um, I'm thinking I'm searching for credentials. It would be mm -hmm. nice to see can I have a place where I can link. This is credentials and pipeline. This is credentials and administration. Right. Okay. That's, that's there's, proposed. There's an admin component. There's a pipeline component. This is the step called credentials. This is the documentation for credentials. Right. Yeah. right. Or um, this is from the ITEI, for example. Yeah. Or to see, like, if I look for pipeline, I don't know that going to be a disaster, but but I can find here's reference, here's guide, here's a tutorial. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, with the you know, yeah. I, yeah, so from my, my experience, this should not be hard to set up. I mean, we are already building all the documentation from um, code. So it, the data is all there. It's, it's in a parsable machine format already, so it's very easy to upload. Um, like with the plugin site, uh, doing it on every page generation might be expensive, and they may not want us to upload it like 30 times a, a minute or 30 times an hour, I mean. But uh, there's ways to work around it. Like for plugin site, we already we can decouple the uploading of metadata from the site generation. So we could generate the site every hour, but we upload the metadata every three hours. So the same thing here. Like there are ways to work around their limit if they have any limitations. Right. Um, so I will definitely be playing with it more once we get open source thing, and I see us being able to hook this up pretty easily. And then it's just a matter of figuring out what we want to surface. So the more attributes you put in, the easier it is to filter. Or and you can actually do like uh, complex queries. Oh, so I'm right. actually hiding it in the plugin site, but you can actually do like you can actually in that search box do uh, what do you do? Credentials and uh, category colon. I think and filter or something, but like. There's ways for you to en enter a complex category with all the other stuff, like a Google complex query. I don't know how to do it inside this box, but mm. I just hide the fact in my fake UI and my fake search generator. It might be because this the drop the drop down beside it is just query text mm. or something. I don't know. But like it's all doable. So yeah, if we want to have a search just returned, um, just pipeline steps, it'd be easy enough to implement that as a checkbox or anything else. Oh yeah, okay. That, that sounds very attractive because there there certainly are classes of information. There are categories of information that people are searching. Oh, I want, I want exactly a pipeline step. I want exactly installation instructions or, yeah, interesting. Pipeline for Python. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll see what, it, once uh, Olivia and I get this hooked up for open source account, then we'll look into expanding it and seeing what uh, we can support. Because Jenkins IO gets a lot more traffic than plugins site does. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Gavin, thank you. 
uh, other questions from people, other observations. So you 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 talked briefly about Insta Search in the other session. Yeah, that was uh, so Jonathan showed that, and we did when you were typing the. Uh, oh, okay. In the in the UI, right? It's just it's easier to demo that way. So I didn't implement it because I wanted to try to keep it as POC as possible, where we could just drop and disconnect it as quickly as possible, right? But we could have. Uh, type as you go search. So again, if you look at your tab and type in something, you, could, you saw how it searched as you were typing. Right. And that's one of the things they promise is that you can get instant results. That's instant search. Very, very elegant. Okay. Very nice, yeah. We, I tried doing that when I first implemented search in uh, plugin site or when I rehooked it up and it killed the plugin site API because we were doing you know, every keystroke was doing another search and it would take like two seconds oh. to come back. So the page would re-render as you're typing. Yeah, it didn't work. Hmm. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, so we had discussed other possibles. Oleg did a prototype with Elasticsearch and we talked about Google search and think we've excluded Google search because because they don't, they may not see us as fully a nonprofit. And Elasticsearch is <laughs> unlikely because they don't have an open source project right now. Probably. Right. And, and Gavin, uh, you you talk about something you are seeing with Oliver, uh, Olivier. Uh, so Algolia offers some plans for open communities. We yep. we don't fit. We don't fit in. in oh, any we just plans. haven't. We haven't asked yet. So oh, the, you asked it for oh. Uh, Olivier this afternoon is supposed to be doing. I'm using meetings all day. This is my first free block all day. Um, so mm -hmm. he's going to contact the, uh, the 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 team on their side and just say, hey, can we get it? And they're going to go, mm, yeah, nice. this is perfect. And we already have the banner there, so they're happy. So we should be able to get it without addition. Well, we're very easy if you, we, we fit with that. Yeah, plan. I put the very important search by Agolia link in there. <laughs> That's how Mark and I were testing to see if the plugin site had updated yet. No banner that, didn't work yet. That was that was our red flag, right? And and there are still surprises there, right? I had to I had to flush my cache, my data cache. So I assume, yeah. but. But so what? I mean, it, it, it really behaves exceptionally well now. And now that it, it, it's not likely to change again, it should stay working for a while. The content okay. is separate from the, the search results or the, sorry, the implementation is different than the search results. Yeah, Once, uh, one of the requirement to free communities is just put their names, but there is no need for so, so big logo. Maybe, for example, in the first, uh, last site I, I Send yeah. you. There is a small logo in, in in the bottom of field. There is no need to be so big. This this page at the best of times is very hard to style. So we had oh. it. We had it in the corner, but when you shrink it down to half the screen width, not not mobile width, half the screen width, oh, it was just okay. off the screen. So we uh, so Zybeck and I just were like, mm, we'll we'll put it there. There is fine. Oh, so we, okay, can, okay. we can fix it later. I'm always of the opinion you can always fix it later. So we might as well get something that works and then fix it, then worry about making it right the first time. Yeah, calling calling the page difficult to style is such a polite term. It's a, it's a very, the search page is very legacy, but as we keep improving it, we'll, <laughs> you know, we're getting improvements. Like, did you, did any of you know that you could change different result types? Have you ever used them? Next to the search button, there's three different gray, uh, gray boxes. The oh, right. these. Oh, yeah. right. Did you know that this existed? <laughs> I helped no. build this page and I didn't know this thing existed. I just noticed today when I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, there's a lot of legacy from a long time ago about these results. I don't think there's any point in having anything other than the squares. <laughs> right. The, this sort of cards layout because, well, the others, oh, that's interesting. And it, it, it certainly gives me more data, right? Yeah. Because if I remember it in the squares, I don't see the Jenkins. Oh, no, it's got the same data, right? It's just yeah. a different layout. Just CSS, there's no difference in behavior. Oh. So I would personally remove it, but it's just not a priority for any of us. So it's a good summer of code if someone wants to come in and clean up this page to make it more uniform. Right. Well, and, and boy, that would be an experience in JavaScript in 
legacy JavaScript and don't break a, a production site kind of thing. Oh, I have no problem breaking production sites. I do it all the time. I'm good at it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, broke, I had pagination broken last night. You remember that? So I'm good at it. Just don't <laughs> catastrophically break production. But when we right. start with students, we want to teach them how not to do it if they don't have to. Yeah. I actually can, believe in very much, have to. I very much believe in uh, learning to fix the problems instead of worrying about avoiding them. Right. So if, if you're afraid of making mistakes, you're going to make more mistakes than if you are comfortable fixing them if you do make a mistake. Probably. Yeah. So, okay. but I agree. Don't, don't break it on purpose, but don't be afraid if you did break it. Good. All right. So I am near exhaustion. It's almost been 12 hours for me. Are there other topics before we conclude? Yeah, we've covered a lot. I'm impressed. You got, you got two people from, that go to the board meetings if you have any other questions while we're here too. Thank you. No. All right, so tomorrow morning, uh, so roughly 14 hours from now, 15 hours from now, we will, no, 14 hours from now, we will have the concluding session for this. You do not have to attend. A recording will be available. In the concluding session, though, we're going to do it a little bit of presentation and very much interaction between the people who are there. Uh, so it will be a more of a working session, but we want, we want I, I realize that it's only 14 hours away and therefore you may want to get some sleep, et cetera, also understood. Just be aware that the session will happen tomorrow and a recording will also be available. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye, thanks, Have everybody. A good day. Bye people.